All right, we ready? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you all for coming. This kind of reminds me of the uh, Warner Brothers cartoon where the construction worker has the frog that sings and puts the sign up, you know, singing frog and nobody comes in and he tries everything until finally he puts the sign up, free beer, and everybody <laughs> piles in. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw the Marcus Raynham uh, presentation in, uh, in the last session, but it was excellent. I mean, he was dead on the money, and uh, I agree with pretty much everything he said. But he, he gave an analogy about the guy who, about security, about the guy who jumps out of an airplane, and on the way down he thinks, gee, did I have my parachute? It's a little bit too late. There's a, it reminded me of another analogy which will serve to be as a, serve as a backdrop for this presentation. Um, in the movie The Magnificent Seven, uh, Steve McQueen tells the Eli Wallach character, he said, you know, it reminds me of the guy who jumped off the 10-story building. And as he passed each floor, the guy on the balcony said, how you doing? He said, so far, so good. And uh, it's only when you hit the bottom and you've uh, been disadvantaged or harmed that you realize that security is a real, real problem that, that hasn't been addressed. Um, we worked, uh, I worked with a, a very large uh, oil company who had spent years exploring for oil in South America. And after an enormous amount of money that had been spent, they finally figured it out and they found the oil and they made calls on cell phones and the South American government had been monitoring every voice call. They quickly nationalized the site and the oil company suffered a multi-billion dollar loss. And you think they would have learned. After suffering a multi-billion dollar loss, the CSO pushed for secure mobile communications for voice calls. $300,000 was turned down because it was too expensive. But another uh, anecdote before we get into this uh, from the other side. I was 10 years out of college in uh, the 70s, and I had written my master's thesis on Formula One racing. And I had developed this little tiny transmitter that was about eight ounces that would go inside the race car. And it would register on a metal antenna at the start-finish line when the car crossed. And so as a result, you could capture real-time data. Well, I went to the U.S. Grand Prix at Watkins Glen in 78. Uh, the Hoyer Watch Company, who was the sponsor of Ferrari and the official timekeeper of Formula One, saw the system, and they didn't understand it. And they came over, and they asked a whole lot of questions. And of course, I knew who Hoyer was, the Hoyer Company was. And uh, I thought that was the end of it. And a week later, uh, Mr. Hoyer of the Hoyer Watch Company from Switzerland flew out to San Francisco, bought the rights to the timing system, and the following year it became the official timing system of Formula One. The reason I point that out is what I didn't know was that the Hoyer Watch Company had spent six years developing an 80-pound transceiver that was inside the Ferrari car, and they were trying to miniaturize it. Well, 80 pounds, 8 ounces. Theirs was a transceiver, ours was a simple passive, or a, a simple transmitter that just was on. It was a one-way device. And that was an example of a company that saw disruptive technology and embraced it. And rather than try and figure out how it worked and all of that, they just said, this is it. This is the simplest solution we've ever seen. The year following year, the Indy 500 called and said, could you build us a similar system for the Indy 500? And we did that. So, Examples of people who ignore the problem until they hit the ground. Another example of people who recognize the problem and are proactive in taking a, a solution uh, forward. So I'm Tony Facenda. I'm founder and CEO of CoolSpan. We're a Bethesda-based company, and we've developed a technology called TrustChip, which is a, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with SD cards uh, that you can buy at uh, Best Buy and a while ago at Circuit City. We've developed the micro SD version of this card that allows you to do secure mobile voice communications. Why is it important? Well, I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about why secure voice communications is the missing piece in mobile security. If you look at the security landscape, it's very complex. I mean, just listening to Marcus's speech, uh, you can understand how complex it is. 
Um, we did a mobile trust survey last year, and 71% of IT managers felt that security was way too complex, too many layers, difficult to manage. You look at secure networks, uh, the M2M interface, and then you look at customer access and laptops. There are solutions for those that are very complex. But when you get to mobile voice, uh, there really isn't any kind of simple, easy to use solution. The solutions that are on the market today for securing mobile voice are cumbersome, difficult, and for sure very expensive. When you look at the IT infrastructure uh, environment, um, there are multiple problems to solve. You have to deal with trusted users, uh, untrusted users, some form of login management. You have to provide network access 24 by 7 for all of your employees, wherever they are. And you have to deal with all of the hackers, viruses, malware that's out there, and do packet inspection, intrusion detection, and so forth. You have to deal with all of these issues, and it seems like every year or so there's yet another suite of problems that you have to deal with. And there is a box for every problem. Um, if you look at the IT landscape, there are more than 900 vendors, at, at least before the economic meltdown, um, that were selling products into the IT infrastructure. And this notion of defense in death, depth, and everything has to work together. So when we tried to break into that market a few years ago with this layer two solution we had, we found out that while we had the most elegant, nicest, simplest solution, it didn't do intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, it didn't work well with all the other boxes in the network, and it's a really difficult market. But the bottom line is there's a never-ending series of problems that have to be solved. So when you look at mobile security, this is the security that deals with the guys in the field, the guys with thumb drives that go out of the office with mobile phones, laptops, and so forth that operate out on the public networks. Nearly 70% of the large enterprise IT managers that we surveyed here in the U.S. last year said that mobile phones are used to discuss business topics considered confidential. Most of the brokerage houses, most of the M&A firms out there specifically prohibit their employees and their managers from discussing anything about mergers, acquisitions, any of that. But they do because they use the mobile phones. And it's not only what they say, but who they're talking to that's important. So it's a really difficult field, and it's really largely unaddressed. If you look at data versus voice, uh, even in large organizations, an IT uh, manager, uh, chief security officer, uh, even if he has 100,000 employees, uh, will principally deal with all of the security relating to data. And he'll manage that his entire career will be spent typically in the enterprise managing security. Um, but when it comes to mobile voice and mobile phones, that phone leaves the office. It's rarely managed by the IT department. And when it comes to voice, the user is generally left naked. I don't know. I would be surprised if anyone in, the phone, in, the, in this room here actually uses a secure mobile voice solution. In the surveys that we've done, it's an extremely low percentage. But the most important information is that which is spoken. When you discuss important deal terms, uh, stock valuations, and acquisition targets, that information is picked up, and it will be used by other people. Um, many security-conscious companies prohibit, as I said earlier, discussing sensitive data on mobile phones. When it comes to USB tokens and thumb drives, cer certain companies actually take draconian measures in that all of the laptops and PDAs that they hand out to their employees are specifically prohibit the use of the USB port. So by design in the OS, they put hooks in there that actually prevent you from taking data out there. And I think the interesting analogy is that thumb drives and SD cards, and in particular SD cards, have no S in the SD. There is no way to really activate the security in an SD card. It's there, but you can't use it. Cell phones, by their design, block the, the utilization of the S commands or the security commands in SD cards. The other big difference is that voice uh, 
networks or voice communications operate on the public switch telephone network, the PSTN. It's not managed by the IT infrastructure. So you have no idea how that call is being monitored, how it's being routed, and, uh, and now we're moving into IP networks in some phones. The return on investment on call interception is very, very high. It's actually difficult to quantify, but the companies that we deal with have told us that they have suffered enormously as a result of mobile voice intercept and look for an easy to use, simple solution that, that's effective. But why do people do it? Because the ROI is very high. Security is difficult to implement. Anyone in this business knows how hard security is to design, and the minute you have a fix for something, there's another problem to solve. Uh, it's very easy to crack. It's easy to get around. But security is a difficult problem to deal with. Over the last couple of years, there have been a variety of well-publicized um, articles about mobile voice breach. Um, Forbes uh, had an article last year that tapping into a private cell phone network is no longer a high-tech trick. There are devices on the market that cost under a thousand bucks that you can simply turn on, type in the cell phone number, who you want to monitor, and you can listen to everything they say on a GSM network. Um, the Sun uh, uh, wrote an article about how the Taliban in Iran, Iraq rather, was actually calling the families of British soldiers on their cell phones and telling them that their children you know, or their sons or daughters had been killed in action. And they were actually monitoring the cell phone calls of the soldiers in the field, calling their families, and then spoofing the soldiers uh, there. Um, in Italy, uh, phone taps were spurring a rush towards encryption. And there was a, a really famous article in Greece where the government put a legal wiretap on an individual. And that legal wiretap was there for the government to use. A hacker was able to get in and exploit the legal wiretap and then recorded the conversations of over 100 people and actually caused one guy to commit suicide. And it was a pretty sad uh, situation. But the problem exists and it's real. So how is a cellular call intercepted? Well, there's several ways to do it. Down at the bottom left, there's tower spoofing, where you put up a cell tower that pretends to be the network you're connecting to. Your phone authenticates to the tower. They grab your credentials, and you're kind of toast. You can do the access of the mobile voice at the network facility. Uh, most uh, major networks are required by law to provide access on a legal wiretap order uh, to provide access uh, to the network but you can also hack that legal tap as was done in Greece and get access there. And finally, there's the illegal uh, monitoring, similar to what we used to do in the uh, days of WEP, where you know, we, we bought uh, Air Snort and, and basically sat there and listened to all of the communications on what the enterprise thought was a secure network. So there are multiple vectors that you can attack to intercept uh, voice. If you go into Google and you simply go GSM intercept, you will see thousands and thousands of articles and uh, advertisements for mobile voice intercept products. In general, they're illegal to use, they're illegal to possess in the U.S., but literally thousands of them are sold every year. We know in the Mideast, uh, this one uh, Chinese product, about $450, there are about 3,500 of them in use in the Mideast intercepting GSM calls. Um, it's a very vibrant marketplace. There are solutions for GSM, CDMA. There are purported to be solutions for WCDMA, um, but they're very expensive at the moment, but price, as always, will come down. So there are many solutions available to law enforcement, but the bad guys get them as well. Did a presentation to a uh, chief of police in a major uh, American city who was adamant from his IT department that their solution, their voice calls were considered to be safe and they were assured as such by the carrier. We showed them the $450 box uh, website, they were stunned and we put them in touch with the Secret Service who confirmed to them that yes in fact that that solution is out there and the bad guys are using it. What most people don't understand with mobile phones is that the only protected piece of the communication is between the phone and the cell tower. 
everywhere on the backbone of the network, through all of the interconnects to other networks, all of that is insecure. What the infrastructure of a cellular system does is basically bridge the different codecs on a Windows mobile and a Symbian phone so you can talk to each other. Without the infrastructure, a Windows mobile and a Symbian phone can't communicate because their codecs are different. So at the infrastructure, they do the transcoding from a Symbian codec to a Windows mobile uh, codec. Well, think about it. If you're trying to do secure voice communications end-to-end, -end, it's not easy to do between Windows Mobile and Symbian because there's no common codec. And the solution that we chose was to actually put the codec in our chip so that there's a common codec regardless of the type of phone. So the system, the infrastructure, does a switch connection, and it's mandatory to bridge different phone types. But outside of an end-to-end -end security solution, the clear text is available at every point from tower to tower. The only part that is secure is between the tower and the handset, and even that is available to you for 450 bucks to break that code. And passive solutions that monitor uh, the tower to handset communications are impossible to detect. There's really no way to tell that you're being hacked. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the threat envelope uh, of what is being dealt with and, and what's changed over the last few years. And there's some really interesting uh, conclusions. I went to a presentation by Dr. Joel Brenner, who was director of counterintelligence for the FBI, and there's some really interesting things. We'll get to that in a second. But what's at risk today? Well, the impact of a compromise can cause operational security, can cause a direct financial loss, um, you can lose IP, uh, you can have, uh, your brand can be put at risk, and certainly there's a legal risk uh, to your stockholders for not taking adequate measures to protect the IP of the company. Um, and then there's all of the other risks that go around it. But the risk envelope is pretty bad, and what's changed though is really interesting. Dr. Joel Brenner says that if you go back to the end of the Second World War, 1945, Almost all of the secrets that the U.S. had were secrets that were held by the government. By 2008, almost all of the government secrets are now held by private industry under contract. The big uh, global 500 companies that do all of the DOD work basically today hold all the government secrets. Um, the, internationally, the boundaries between state and criminal espionage is blurred. You go into Russia, you go into China, the difference between private and state-sponsored espionage is almost uh, um, impossible to detect. Um, there's increased competition in the marketplace. There's increased competition between countries. And what was really interesting to me was Dr. Brenner talked about the, the woman who hacked a U.S. Uh, Fortune 500, Fortune 100 company, and uh, she was a Chinese national that got involved as, uh, in the chief security office of, of this company. And she was caught in Chicago boarding an airplane. And in her luggage, they found uh, several hard disks, I think 40 or 50 thumb drives with literally gigabytes and gigabytes of the company's IP, the company's patent uh, submissions that were in process, literally everything. And what was the threat envelope for her or the risk envelope? she was deported as a hero to her country. So what Dr. Brenner said, when it comes to foreign espionage, there's no risk, no fear. When an American gets threatened by an FBI investigation, they, they shake and, and tremble for fear of going to jail. Foreign national gets caught, they go home as a hero. So there's no threat perceived by the foreign nationals that do the hacking. There's a wide variety of network access. You can access just about anything from anywhere today. The attacks are easier and easier to accomplish. And what's uh, amazing is that CEOs, CFOs, and CSOs are generally naive to the threat. They certainly know about data security, but when it comes to mobile voice, there aren't any solutions out there that, they're, that they focus on. But what we have learned is that companies that have been damaged by economic espionage really take the threat seriously and they've been looking for simple solutions. So why do people do it? Again, the return on, it, on investment on mobile intercept is, is high and that's why it continues to be done. 
What's another factor is that the smartphone market is eclipsing the computer market. If you look at smartphones five years ago, they were essentially non-existent. Uh, last year, smartphones began to eclipse the sale of laptops here in the U.S. And smartphones are getting more and more powerful, more and more capable. And as you look at shipments of smartphones, they've actually overtaken those of laptop computers. And uh, as netbooks are rapidly coming to the market now, uh, this trend will no doubt continue. And so what you have is increasing cap power, increasing capability, increasing memory in devices that are absolutely portable and, and get outside the wall of the enterprise. So smartphones, in a sense, are, are the new laptops. They're susceptible to intercept, but they're also very well, very easily left behind at airports, uh, going through checkout, on trains, whatever. Interesting statistics, Engadget said that more than 10,000 laptops are reported lost at the 36 airports every week. I, I found that an actually staggering number. 35% are, are reclaimed, 65% are lost forever. 250,000 mobile phones and handheld devices will be left behind at the airports this year alone. Only 25 to 30 percent are ever reclaimed by the owners. If you look at most laptops and certainly almost all cell phones, there's very little protection for the data that's in those devices. There's typically a, a, a login, but that can be generally defeated on a laptop, and most people never put PIN numbers even simple PIN numbers on their phones. And in London, 100,000 devices are lost on the London Underground each year. When you think of a, a thumb drive that a few years ago had uh, 32 uh, megabytes of data, today they have four gigabytes of data. So there's an enormous amount of data that can be stored on a handheld thumb drive, and there's almost always no protection for that data that's on that drive. Anybody that finds it can access it. Smartphones handle um, both voice and data. That represents a huge exposure to the enterprise. Uh, you can lose valuable data, trade secrets, and certainly when the user has all this data on his device and then loses that device, that user is no longer productive until that data somehow gets replenished. Um, data is often exchanged with the enterprise, and certainly plug-in memory cards and thumb drives are um, what people use today. And uh, in fact, I didn't know what the solution was going to be here, so I put my presentation on a thumb drive just in case. But even this thumb drive, if lost, is available to whoever finds it. There's really no protection built into the drive. So it's not enough just to protect the pipe. You have to protect, protect the data at the endpoints as well. Um, hurdles to enterprise-ready smartphones. Uh, IT director's ability to manage these devices um, hasn't really kept pace. Uh, the devices are changing. The IT administrator typically has no control over what users in his organizations buy phone, what phones that his users buy. Some will buy Blackberries, some will buy Windows Mobile, some will buy Apple iPhones, and, and so forth. And there's uh, an exploding uh, group of Android-type phones that are out there as well. Business applications for smartphones are proliferating. And increasingly, many people tend to leave their laptops behind and bring their smartphones to um, the business. And as you'll see in a slide or two uh, from now, when you look at the design envelope that an OEM has to deal with, it's really a daunting problem to address. So rapid smartphone growth, if you plot market adoption requirements versus cellular usage, Smartphones have improved performance, smaller form factors, reduced price points. The functionality continues to improve over time. But as they grow over time, what's going to drive it are going to be applications. At the end of the day, it's not the gadget, it's what the gadget does. And the growth in the number of applications is growing. Strong security is the missing gap, if you will, is the, is the gap between adoption and rapid uh, proliferation in the market. Security is the perceived weak link in smartphone design. It really is a barrier to adoption. And, but when you look at how do you address security, as we talk to OEMs, it's not something they want to specifically address. It, it's a real problem. 
when we talk to IT administrators in the U.S., 70% of them say that mobile phones are used to discuss business topics considered confidential. Many of these companies stress to their employees not to discuss uh, topics that are potentially detrimental to their business if uncovered by outsiders. But yet, most people still use their phones to do that. So as smartphones deploy and become adopted, the information risk to the enterprise is growing and will continue to grow until something is actually done. Um, 2012, we're looking at somewhere north of 700 million smartphones in the market from a, an adoption a level that was basically nascent just a few years ago. It, it's a staggering shift. So challenges to mobile communications security. Interesting topic. Uh, we did the survey, as I said, and we asked uh, U.S. Uh, chief security officers, are you aware of compromises to voice communications on cellular or mobile networks? 56% no. I was actually surprised that 44% even said yes. If you did this survey outside the U.S., the numbers would be 80% uh, yes, 20% no a completely different uh, shift in thinking outside the U.S. Where, where mobile networks are assumed to be unsafe, where in the U.S. people generally have a trusting attitude towards their communications networks. So following up on that, if you recognize there's a problem, what are you doing about it? Well, 14% said they've already got some form of secure voice solution. Another 14% said they were planning a security solution for mobile voice within the next five years. 72% aren't doing anything but said they would consider an easy, cost-effective solution should one be available. And of the respondent, this represents uh, of the respondents interested in a secure voice solution, 58% answered this particular question. So why the unmet need in cellular encryption? That's really simple. It's hard to do. Uh, it's difficult to manage, and trying to sell into an enterprise that doesn't recognize the threat is a tough sell. Phones are insecure for a bunch of reasons. Um, phones typically aren't managed uh, by the IT department. We spoke to that oil company in, uh, in the UK, a very large oil company, and of their several hundred thousand employees, they don't specify what type of phone they use. Some use Blackberry, some use Windows mobile phones, some use Symbian phones. Uh, it, it runs the gamut and the employees are free to choose uh, what phones they have. So when you look at it from that point, access to data on a plethora of handheld devices are not managed by the IT department and often don't use the IT infrastructure, and certainly not when doing voice. Phones can connect to anyone, anytime, on any network. So again, back to that analogy where an IT administrator, even in a large company, will rarely deal with more than 100,000 employees in that company. When phones get out on the PSTN, you could be talking to any one of a billion phones out there at, at any time. Phones aren't designed to protect your data. I mean, it's as simple as that. You look at any OEM manufacturer of cell phones, there are virtually no provisions to protect your data on their phone, let alone voice. So the result is mobile voice is insecure and mobile data is, is insecure. If you were to design a, a cell phone, and I've been in this business, security issues are pervasive within the device. So I'm an OEM and I'm going to design a cell phone and I think I can build the best cell phone on the market. Well, I got a whole bunch of decisions to make. Right off the bat, am I doing Windows Mobile, Symbian, Blackberry, Linux, Android? I have all of those choices from an OS to deal with. Then I have to deal with all of the other peripheral technologies out there, Wi-Fi, Edge, uh, CSD or GPRS. I've got to make a fundamental decision, am I going GSM, CDMA, or wideband CDMA? And then I've got to support peripherals like SIM cards if it's GSM, an SD card for memory, for removable memory, and I've got Bluetooth. Every one of those interfaces has a security implication, and every one of those security implications is different. 
Then I've got the whole application suite. What am I developing? Any application I'm going to develop, I have to think about security. Uh, RIM has done a terrific job with email security, but that's about it. The other platforms really don't do much about it. And then final, the piece de resistance, is the data port on a cell phone. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of something called CSI Stick. It's a $200 device that uh, police departments use for forensic recovery. And take just about any Windows Mobile, BlackBerry, Symbian phone, plug the CSI Stick into the bottom of the data port, and guess what? You've got everything. All the email, all the SMS messages, anything that's on a removable card is accessible through that data port. Basically, everything is there. There's essentially no protection provided to the user by the OEM for the data that's on their device. It, it's, it's a gaping hole. And trying to look at this from the application standpoint is really even more interesting. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about designing a, an application. And I'm this uh, application developer, and I'm going to develop a, a customer application where access to real-time data is vital. And I want to make that application really secure, because the data that I'm passing out to these mobile devices out in the field has some data that's not only important to my company, but it's important to my customer as well. And I have to maintain confidentiality. Real-time, secure access is absolutely critical. And I have to deal with not just the data in motion between my network or my server and these mobile devices, but what happens to that data when it's on the device, when it's, uh, when it's been delivered. So I'm the developer, and I want to implement those four specific solutions. What's available to me? What's the best practice? How do I develop des or design, develop, test, and certify? Now, I will submit that the guy that's writing the terrific CRM application probably doesn't know a whole lot about key management, authentication, security, revocation. So this poor designer goes along and he looks and he says, OK, I've got the best practices solution for that particular platform. I've got authentication solutions, management solutions, uh, transmission solutions, PKI and cryptography toolkits. I've got all sorts of stuff. So I'm going to pick an authentication solution for my CRM application. I'm going to do a, a, a management or synchronization solution. And I'm going to get this library here for the transmission for the VPN. And I'm going to put it all together. And now I've got my terrific solution for my CRM application that I can deploy for my Windows mobile clients. So that's terrific. Second developer comes along, and he's going to write his application. And he'll pick probably some different authentication solution, some different key management solution, and so forth. So what you end up with on a mobile device is multiple solutions are really multiple problems. Every one of those packages up there has their advantages and disadvantages. You start mixing and matching different authentication and different encryption solutions. Every solution is a gateway to hacking the next solution if it's not done right. And you often end up with multiple instances of the same or competing libraries running on the same time, at, on the same device. You get into resource utilization. I remember when I wrote an application for the uh, Palm, uh, plat or for the BlackBerry platform way back when. And uh, it was actually on the RIM 950 before there was the phone side of the RIM product. And I went to use uh, elliptic, elliptic curve cryptography on that device and found out that when I did that, it took up all the room on the device. There was just no memory. So I either had an application or I had security, but I didn't have both. Over time, however, the memory increased and we were able to do it. But I found in one case there were three different applications, each written with three different libraries, each of which were using the same kinds of resources on the phone at the same time. So you run this issue of host processor performance. Every one of these applications takes uh, resources away from the machine. What we focused on is platform security. It's a better approach. Provide the best possible key management, authentication, and encryption solution, abstract it for the particular device, and make it easy to do. 
So when it comes to secure voice, however, voice should be secured between two users, and it should eliminate any intervening infrastructure so there's no possibility of intercept. There are certain laws like CALEA here in the U.S. where you have to provide access to the encrypted data, but you don't have to provide the keys. Uh, end user devices are specifically exempted for that. So good peer-to-peer -peer security would provide that end-to-end -end security that users and administrators would be looking for. But users don't often belong to the same organization when they're exchanging voice data. So how do you manage credentials? The only way to do it is to do peer-to-peer -peer authentication and you have to address at the end Windows Mobile, Symbian, uh, RIM, Linux, uh, Android, and so forth. Each of the platforms are different. And audio rerouting issues are difficult on, Windows, on Symbian. They're just about impossible on Windows Mobile and not even available on RIM. We'll talk about that in, in a moment. So when you're looking at the secure voice solution, Connecting incompatible platforms is not easy, and there's some daunting challenges. So, evaluating solutions to mobile communication security. Whenever you implement security, there are three areas of expertise you have to deal with, and in descending importance are key management, authentication, and encryption. Um, I often hear people say, well, we're using 256-bit AES, and we're golden. And I often say, well, how are you storing the keys? And I get the blank stare. And it doesn't matter how good the encryption is. If you don't do your authentication right, you don't store your keys properly, it doesn't matter how good your encryption is. And, and it's just a problem that most people in this business simply don't understand. I mean, I remember the, the uh, early days of WEP when they stored the keys in the registry. Uh, duh. And, uh, you know, it was just amazing. But each of those solutions has particular issues that have to be handled. There are multiple solutions for each, and each solution represents its own problem. And you don't just buy three solutions, plug them together. You have to carefully integrate all three of those solutions. And ultimately, what you want is a platform solution rather than a point-specific solution. So the way I look at it is that whenever you're looking at a security solution, there's key management, authentication, and encryption. Key management is the biggest of the three gears. It's the most complex. It's the most critical. You don't get that right. It doesn't matter. Everything has to be fully integrated, and so there are no security laps between key management and authentication. Authentication should never expose anything that gives you access to the encryption key and so forth. So doing all three properly is critical, usually not done right by most security professionals. The need for end-to-end -end security is important. Whenever you're connecting two devices, certainly with mobile voice, uh, are you doing hub and spoke, which you're kind of forced to do with an IP solution, uh, voice over IP, or are you doing peer-to-peer, -peer, as you do on CSD? Um, and then how do you handle conferencing? There's nobody out there that has a secure mobile voice solution that even addresses uh, conferencing. What IT professionals have told us out there and security professionals is the networks themselves have to be considered insecure. And in a global context, an IT infrastructure isn't suited properly for the mass authentication requirements that you have to deal with. Security has to be managed, and the, the data that goes across the pipe and the data that resides on the end user device has to only be available, no matter where it's at, to the designated parties. The fact that it's been delivered to a, a, a smartphone or to a thumb drive is irrelevant if access to that data can be compromised by anybody who finds the lost device. And data security, you know, again, data in motion is one piece of it. The other piece is data at rest. It's really not good enough to have a VPN, and uh, data at rest must be protected at all times. And as I often say, securing the pipe is only a part of the solution, but even that solution isn't often done uh, well. I'm going to go through some examples of three popular platforms and how they've addressed security. Uh, BlackBerry, Windows Mobile, and iPhone. Each of these solutions are completely uh, different. Enterprises uh, like each of these phones for different reasons. 
Each have handled security somewhat differently. Each have risks. And I, just for time's sake, I don't have Symbian or Android or Linux, but these are three popular iPhone, uh, phones up there on the market. If you look at uh, BlackBerry, it's done well in enterprise and government uh, circles. Um, it's done well because they've done a pretty good job of implementing email security. It's been widely adopted. The BEZ servers work quite well. Um, and email security is handled by the BEZ server, the uh, BlackBerry Exchange server. And it provides good enough security. But other applications on the RIM platform aren't secure. And voice security isn't even addressed at all. And trying to get in and speak with uh, RIM about mobile voice security has not been easy. There's really not much interest in that. And in particular, on the BlackBerry, there is no possibility today of doing an IP solution that's supported by RIM. There's no access uh, to the IP to run a SIP stack on a BlackBerry. Windows Mobile is very highly integrated into the enterprise. It's easily understood. If you did a survey of IT professionals, uh, the vast majority of them would say they have specific Windows experience and expertise. Uh, Microsoft announced their new security suite last year aimed at improving the security infrastructure for mobile devices. Um, but there's really no consistent method for application security. So when it comes to authentication and security, you know, it's left up to the individual application designer. Key management is a mystery. It's often uh, poorly managed, and voice security is just non-existent. The interesting thing on Windows Mobile is there's no ability to reroute the audio. They don't provide any hooks in the OS to route the audio. So any vendor that's out there selling uh, or attempting to sell a software-based uh, secure voice solution can't touch the audio. So the only way you can grab the audio is to route it to the loudspeaker or to the Bluetooth headset. You can't use the native earpiece to get audio on a, on a, on a uh, Windows mobile device. So you have this kind of silly situation where you can build this terrific, secure, mobile voice solution for a Windows product, and the only way you can get to the voice is listen to it on the loudspeaker. Um, the result is that um, a Windows mobile device that has multiple applications, each of which provides security, you often have multiple separate instances of, of security technologies. And most security technologies aren't designed to be managed out in the field. Uh, when you get into issues of key management, revocation, uh, and so forth, they're really daunting problems. And again, you know, separate Windows mobile from the OEM who builds the product. There are a lot of companies that build Windows Mobile handsets. The OEM uses the OS um, under license, but basically the OEM is responsible for implementing security at the hardware level. And in the case of the CI CSI stick, you can just about get to anything on the handset. There's no inherent security. When you look at the iPhone, uh, it's easy to use, very consistent interface not fully integrated into the enterprise. It's, it's in the minority when it comes to the enterprise side. While it is rapidly gaining share in the market, it's powerful, it's elegant, it's flexible, but there is no built-in security for applications, uh, for network connectivity, and certainly not uh, for voice. It's completely unaddressed. And in particular, on the iPhone, uh, Apple makes it absolutely clear, thou shall not, that will not, thou must not, implement any kind of IP voice on the phone that operates on the carrier. To do so violates the license agreement of the iPhone. So try and do secure voice on an iPhone, can't do it. Try and run a SIP stack that operates on the public network, not allowed. So three different platforms, three completely different approaches um, to security. So. In summary now, best practices for mobile voice and data security. Voice and data security is common on the handset. It needs to be addressed at the platform level. Um, you have to ensure that business voice calls are encrypted. The problem with any solution out there is typically um, if you get a software solution, there are a bunch of vendors that have a secure solution, they typically require the user to do something. 
Anytime you want to do a secure call, you actually have to get in there and type uh, 1888 and then the number. And that tells the application, oh, he wants to make a secure call. Or you have to enter in certain prefixes. Anyone who's used a Sectera phone for real high security stuff knows that you've got to carry the manila folder with you, that whenever you want to actually use the phone, you've got to go through certain hoops to use a secure phone. Sectera-based hardware phones can only call other Sectera-based hardware phones. You have to fill out a lot of paperwork, and boy, don't ever take that out of the country without permission. And if you lose that phone, there's hell to pay at every level of the organization. So hardware-based phones are really difficult to use. Software-based solu solutions require the user at every step to do something different when making a phone call. They either dial a prefix, they run an application, they have to do something different. So networks have to be considered as untrusted pipes. And if you go into a secure mobile solution thinking anything else, you're, you're fooling yourself. End-to-end -end security has to be the way you do it. It's preferred. You can't do a solution that uses infrastructure. The data must be secured at all times, not just in transit between my phone and your phone, but the data that's conveyed, that's stored, must be secured at all times. Security must persist no matter what you do. Even if you lose the phone, even if you lose the SD card, that security persists at all times, independent of any action that the user takes. You have to educate the senior staff uh, on risks. And I got a kick out of Marcus's uh, speech earlier this morning when he talked about, here's the guys at the trenches doing all this work, and here are the executives thinking they got a 90% solution where the IT guys are working on the 50% problem. Senior staff doesn't necessarily understand the risk. They understand the threat uh, sometimes, but just don't take the risks into concern. And the other end of the stick is ensure that employees understand the nature of mobile phone intercepts. There isn't a, uh, um, uh, a banking firm, uh, an M&A firm, a hedge fund uh, that doesn't educate their employees on mobile phone security. And the question is, at the end of the day, why do people breach security? Because people tend to do what's easiest. And if you have a choice between making an easy call and making a secure call that's hard to do, over time, people will gravitate to easy versus hard. And there's just no way to stop it unless you make the security transparent to the user so the user doesn't think and, most importantly, has no control over the fact that he's making a secure call. The phone has to default to a secure call when calling another member of the organization. So platform security, in my opinion, <coughs> makes the most sense. You have to integrate both data at rest and data in motion security. Whatever you do from a platform security, it has to provide a common framework uh, for both transport level connectivity and the application security. And rather than providing the user with all kinds of choices for key management, for authentication and encryption, a single, well thought out, fully integrated, very secure key management, authentication and encryption solution that supports any number of contexts for any application is the best way to do it. The user only needs to make a few function calls to set up a secure context, authenticate the other side, get an encrypted session going. The application designer who's using that platform approach doesn't need to be involved in application security, uh, doesn't need to be involved in key management, authentication, or encryption solutions. The easiest way today to do it is to implement that in the form of plug-in hardware. Getting the OEMs to do this is a pipe dream. They won't do it unless the customers demand it. Customers apparently aren't demanding it because OEMs continue to produce hardware that has no security. Operating systems themselves that the OEMs license provide little security. So the only way to do it for the next five years is a plug-in piece of hardware that plugs into a slot on the phone that can be adapted to any modern handset that provides and secures all of the hardware issues relative to security, bridges adaptability for any application on the phone, and it gives you the best of both worlds. Over time, as people get comfortable and begin recognizing the real threat for secure data, secure voice, both data at rest and data at motion, 
OEMs will respond to integrate that into the phone. And finally, management must be secure at all times. Not good enough to have a great authentication, uh, encryption, uh, and um, key management solution if the management over the air isn't secure. So it's a daunting problem. And just one last plug for us, what we've done is to develop that hardware infrastructure in the form of a micro SD card along with an application that runs on Symbian, Windows Mobile, BlackBerry handsets that uses a self-contained external encryption authentication key management solution that, that handles all of that for both voice, data at rest, as well as data in motion. Um, thank you. If there are any questions, either now or later, I think you'll have the slides uh, available. Um, please feel free to give me a call or address your questions. Any questions today? How do you handle Kalia? Kalia, it's, there's an interesting carve out with Kalia. Um, who asked the question? Oh, sorry, I, I didn't see. Yeah, as I, I don't know if you heard earlier, I, I did talk about Kalia. Kalia um, requires you to provide access to the communications. It does not require you to give access to the keys. As long as you can provide access to the path, which we do, you can go to a, um, a T-Mobile or an AT&T uh, switch and get access to the peer-to-peer -peer authentication between mobile voice, that's fine. You, you can do that. What you can't do is get access to the keys, and Kalia doesn't require you to do that. Um, they're aware from some of the uh, media that's out there. Uh, I know four years, three, four years ago when we started looking at this problem, there was almost nothing in the media. Uh, over the last two years, uh, we've been out there beating the bushes uh, on our PR tours, uh, try, our media tours, trying to educate the media about the issue of mobile voice intercept. Outside the U.S., it's a real problem that people are aware of, and that's why I said if you did that same survey outside the U.S., the numbers would be dramatically different. But uh, the issue of what happened in Chicago with uh, one uh, uh, foreign national that got caught and had transcripts of all these voice intercepts that she had done, um, the issue in Greece uh, that, that was in every newspaper uh, has caused people to be aware. Yeah, you have to be careful. In, in Russia, for instance, uh, you shall not be caught with uh, a secure encrypted device. Uh, it's uh, bad news there. We actually have uh, agencies looking at our technology. They're already playing with it because it's unobtrusive and it's not discoverable. And uh, there's a version of our application that operates in stealth mode. So when you use the phone, you're simply making a phone call. And uh, we end up in the background. All we do is hook the native dialer. So if I'm calling your phone, I'm just dialing your normal phone number. But I know that your secure number is different, and I know where it's at, and I actually use that call to make the call. But um, yeah, you can have, Kalia only requires you in the US to have access at the switch uh, to, the, to the stream, if you will. So the fact that I'm calling somebody in another country, the other country side, that's their problem. But the, the networks are different, the country's requirements are different everywhere you go. It becomes the user's problem, and uh, we always say in our literature, be aware of, you know, buyer beware of the problem. And, and the last question, uh, one of your criticisms of Sakara uh, was that it only works with other Sakaras. Uh, sorry if I missed this in the first few minutes of your present, uh, but is your solution interoperable with things outside of the uh, East End ecosystem? I'm sorry, I didn't hear all that. Basically, does, does your product interoperate with anything else? Um, our product basically doesn't interfere with the normal operation of the phone. So if you're calling your wife, your children, you're just making a normal call. The minute you're calling another phone, 
Um, let's say I'm calling your phone, and I call your phone, your phone answers, we have a normal voice call. The next time I call you, when my phone calls your phone, if your phone had, for instance, a trust chip in it, the instant your phone answered, my phone would be able to detect that your phone has that chip in there, and it will basically attempt to negotiate uh, uh, what's, what are called trust groups. It'll then attempt to authenticate. From that point on, every subsequent call will start out secure before it even answers, before your phone answers. Any other questions? Um, I have samples of the trust chip. Uh, if you'd like to take a look at its insides, I think you'll be amazed. But uh, thank you.